If you have your Bibles, open up to Philippians. We are in our second week of our Advancing Out of Adversity series. You can also go to our app once again and go to sermon notes in the media, go to sermon notes, and you'll see my sermon outline there with some fill in the blanks that you can fill in as we're going along. I read an article in a, a periodical this past week, and let me just quote what the article said. It was from a dentist. I have seen more tooth fractures in the last six weeks than in the previous six years. Almost immediately, I noticed an uptick in phone calls. Jaw pain, tooth sensitivity, achiness in the cheeks, and migraines. When I reopened my practice in early June, the fracture started coming in at least one a day, every single day that I've been in office. On average, I'm seeing three to four, the bad days are six plus fractures. The obvious answer is stress. From COVID-induced nightmares to doom surfing to coronaphobia, it's no secret that panic-related anxiety is affecting our collective mental health. That stress in turn leads to clenching and grinding, which can damage the teeth. Is there no end to this, is my first question. At what point in time was not one part of our physical, emotional, spiritual being not going to be affected by this? In addition to that, I don't know if I'm the only one who is pretty much fed up with the political season already. I'm, I'm going to vote. I always vote. I'm a good citizen. But I have just, every political race, every political commercial, it just seems like what is happening now is this division has gotten so great that I'm looking for any politician who has America at the forefront of their most concern, but it seems like the most concern is I just got to figure out a way how to put the other guy down. Because it's not about making America better, it's about I got to beat this guy. I got to beat this girl. And that's what it's all about there. I'm just wondering, somewhere in Washington, D.C., is there one rational, calm, humble voice Take that and kind of let it simmer on the back burner for a second. There are literally thousands of ways, if you think about it and look at it, that God speaks to us through creation that lets us know how omnipotent and wise he is and how he, well, he put things together. And in the Christian life, one of the most important things in the Christian life is an attitude of humility. And God did something amazing from our very first moment that we enter this world, he gives us that lesson and teaches us about humility. If you are familiar about this, the easiest and best way for a child to be born is when that child comes out with their head, their face looking down. If the face is up, it's gonna be a much longer, much more laborious, much more difficult process. God teaches us the best way to enter this world is in a position of humility with our face down. All across our society, I believe we have faces up, and it's the reason why our nation is going through hard labor right now is because we have not realized you have to humble yourself before the mighty and loving hand of God in order for him to exalt you and lift you up. So we have been looking at Philippians. And going through this message of how to advance out of adversity, and in the middle of Philippians, we have this phenomenal chapter, chapter 2, which teaches us about humility. And so really what I could do right now in the next sentence is wrap the sermon up, say a prayer, amen, and we head for the house. If you want to advance out of adversity, one of the things you do is you humble yourself and you find a way to serve others. Y'all good? All right, well, let's let's head over there. That ain't gonna happen. The partner, when in, in chapter one, Paul talked about unity, and the partner of unity is humility, and the enemy of unity is pride. And Paul concludes chapter one, the last paragraph, with whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. And one of the ways that we conduct ourselves worthy of the gospel is that we live with a spirit of humility and we serve others out of that humility. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, 
If any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not only look out for your own interest, but also for the interest of others. Verse 3, he says, do nothing. Now, glance down at verse 14. The first two words are, do everything. Verse 3, do nothing. Verse 14, do everything. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gave us two perfect bookends for this library on humility that he's giving us. Do nothing, do everything, and in between, he gives us this phenomenal, perfect example of humility as he talks about Jesus Christ. So we have this two perfect bookends that we can put things together, and throughout this chapter, there are three things I want us to look at this morning, basically revolving all around Jesus, his humility, his exaltation, and his examples. His examples are two men by the name of Timothy and Epaphroditus at the very end of the chapter. But first, do nothing out of selfish ambition. That word in the original Greek, that selfish ambition, means seeking to win followers. I want people to be on my side. My motivation is to make myself look bigger. The motivation here is I will demean myself in order to gain something. Now, the reason I put that out there is because the Greek word that is used for selfish ambition, when you could look at the etymology, the history of the word, that word was used to describe a harlot, a prostitute. I will demean myself in order to gain this money. I will demean myself in order to get this power, this pride. I will demean myself in order to get myself to get people on my side. There's a whole nother sermon on the spirit of prostitutes in the church. I want people on my side. Paul says, do nothing out of that motivation. He says, do nothing out of vain conceit. And then he comes right behind that statement. And in verse five, he talks about the humility of Christ. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross, who being in the very nature God. We have to talk a little bit of theology for a couple of minutes. So wake up, slap yourself around a little bit and make sure you are awake for this. Jesus Christ is the most unique person this world has ever seen. He is one individual with two natures. If you see him only as God, the portrait painted of Jesus, if you see him only as God, you're missing half the portrait. You're missing the side of him that is the son of man, that God became flesh. It's the most amazing thing. Once you grasp and understand this, this blows your mind that God said, I will leave heaven and I will come down and take upon the form of humanity. If you only see him as God, you're missing half the picture. If you only see him as human, you're missing the other side of the picture. You're missing son of God. You're missing the miraculous that is God. You are missing the God who comes down and invades this room with his presence when we worship him. It is the God who comes in and as we just lift up hands, healing in bodies can occur, infillings of the Holy Spirit can occur, relationships can be restored because there is a miraculous thing that happens when you are in the presence of God. So if you only see him as one part of the picture, you're missing an important part of the picture. Jesus Christ was one person with two natures. Theologians have a fancy name for this. They call it the hypostatic union. It's a big fancy term that means undiminished deity and perfect humanity united forever in one. Now, if that sounds a little bit confusing, that's because it is. We are talking about the inner nature and personality of the Son of God and the Son of God leaving heaven and coming to this world. And I'm here to tell you, I've been studying it for 40 years, and I cannot yet wrap my finite mind around the infinite that is God. But that's why we worship him. That's why we praise him. He is beyond us. 
He is above us. He is strong. That, that's why, because the fact that I cannot get my little finite mind around all that is God is the reason he is worthy of worship. If I could understand him, can I get personal? If you could understand him, he ain't much of a God. How many of and you? No, I'm not going to go there. I can't even repair my car anymore. I don't know what, what, what you open up the hood. I, I can't even figure out an engine. And I can't figure out God. That's how big he is. He left heaven and was incarnated into flesh, the hypostatic union, but made himself nothing and taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself. Jesus did not empty himself of, di of divinity. He did not empty himself of, of the miraculous. That is why you cannot separate the two. The best way I can try to explain it is this. You have something beautiful. You have something that's expensive, crystal. You can take the little water and you rub the top and it sings back to you. Y'all know what that is? Okay, you've got, you've got something that is valuable. This is heaven. This is the divinity. And then you've got just this little bitty old plastic cup that ain't worth nothing. Jesus did not empty himself of his divinity. He emptied it into a vessel that looks like us. He was fully God and fully man. Hypostatic union, both natures working there. And this is what makes this absolutely amazing if you can ever grasp and, 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 and comfort them because Jesus was in heaven. You, you know heaven, don't you? There, there's, there's no problems in heaven. There's no politicians in heaven. There's no, I'm going to back up, let me back I'm sorry, I'm sorry. There's no political races in heaven. Okay, the office has already been established, okay? The elections are, the, the, he's been voted on, he's there. there. There's no disease in heaven. There's no complaints in heaven. Heaven is absolutely perfect, and that's not a myth. That's the reality that is there. Heaven is perfect, and God left that place to come to this place, knowing what would happen to him when he got to this place. That's why we worship him. That is the amazing thing about this. He left all of that, and he comes down, and, and, and no matter how far down you go, no matter where your struggle takes you, your loneliness, your rejection, your, your quarantine, your sickness, you can't go so low that Jesus cannot get underneath you and lift you back up. That's what it means when he says, in the form of God, he thought not right of equal God, but made himself of no reputation and came down to this earth. And Paul says, here's your example. Think like this guy. Be a servant the way he was. The original sin was pride. When you go back to Genesis chapter 3, Satan goes to Eve and he says, you will be like God. And that's what motivates her. That's what tempts her to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I'm not real sure <coughs> what Eve's thinking was but we have a pretty good idea of what her thinking was. But when you read Philippians chapter two, being like God means you're humble. Being like God means you are willing to set aside all that is your good stuff in order to serve anybody and everybody. There was a former baseball player and sportscaster by the name of Ralph Kiner. One year, Ralph led the major leagues in home runs and he went to his manager. His manager at that time was a guy by the name of Branch Rickey. And he went to the manager. He said, Branch, I want a raise. And Branch said, no, you're not getting a raise. He says, hey, I led the league in home runs last year. And Branch Rickey looked at him and said, what place did we come in in our division? And Ralph said, well, we came in last. And Branch said, I can come in last without you. No matter who you think you are or what you've accomplished or what you've done, the Bible says, humble yourself before the Lord. He will exalt you. Who being in the very nature of God. Now, now, now grasp that statement too. Being in the very nature of God. As a matter of fact, if you look at it in your Bible, you've still got it in front of you. Who being in the very nature of God, there will be a comma. And there's a whole lot of other short phrases that end with commas. So really what's happening is you have some things that are placed in between the two major objective uh, themes of that verse. And what the verse is really saying, who being in the very nature of God, he humbled himself. Because of his very nature, 
because he knew who he was, he could humble himself. Humility, serving others, and, and not out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, becomes easier when you know who you are. I'm not perfect. I am flawed. I have all kinds of issues, but I am also redeemed and justified by the blood of Christ. I'm in a process of sanctification. I am a child of God. God has a plan for me. And in, first, in first, uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, we have the promise that he will complete that plan that he has started in me. So no matter what somebody else says about me, it may affect me, but it doesn't determine me because the reason is I know who I am. I am a child of God. I can advance out of adversity because I know who I am in Christ. Jesus could endure everything he had to go through because he knew who he was. In the very nature God, he humbled himself. Jesus could wash the disciples' feet because he knew he was Lord. He could withstand and endure the kiss of Judas because he knew Jesus was the one who would stick closer than a brother. He could withstand Peter's denial because Jesus knew he was the way, the truth, and the life. He could sustain himself in the midst of being rejected by his very own family because he knew who his true brothers and sisters in the Lord were. When you know who you are in Christ, being able to be humble and serve becomes a whole lot easier. This doesn't mean... You know, when somebody says something about you, it's not that it doesn't matter, and it's not that you're being rude or, or arrogant or dismissive. It's just you understand, I'm a child of the king, and the most important opinion about me is what he thinks about me, but not what somebody else thinks about me. And when you are able to reach that point, that's when you can serve in humility. Before that, you're always going to be defending your position. The, the story of Jesus doesn't end with that, humili- with, with, his, with that humbling there. It goes on to his exaltation in verse 9. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, even the death on the cross, which was a humiliating death. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not even going to try to describe what it was like to be stripped of your clothes and nailed to that cross and what happened in, in all the process, but it was a humiliating death. And in the midst of all that, the people around him are insulting him. Even one of the other thieves on the cross insults him and says, hey, if you're who you say you are, save yourself. Come down from the cross and hey, while you're at it, save me too. And Jesus could have said, sucker, you just wait till Sunday morning. Because coming up out of a grave is a whole lot bigger than coming down from this cross. But he didn't do that. Out of his humility, out of his heart, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Sometimes we get caught up with our Fridays. Sometimes we get caught up and we don't see the reality that there is something beyond what's going to be occurring. Many of the people, I've heard the testimonies all week from coming back from this past week from some of our small group leaders, the last thing you talked about in your group is telling you about a setback that became a comeback and all the testimonies that were there. There were people who were facing Fridays. There were people who were facing difficulties. There were people who didn't see how in the world this can work out, but that was Friday and Sunday was coming. And when you understand this process, and he says, therefore, as a result of everything that Jesus did to humble himself, God exalted him as a result of that. And therefore, God placed him in the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that God, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God exalted him from that Friday, brought him through, resurrected on Sunday, And now Jesus sits at the right hand of God where he intercedes for you. Jesus is praying for you today as you go through your Friday that Sunday will come. And the Romans 2,000 years ago thought, we have solved the Christianity problem. We have crucified him. We have put him in the tomb. He is dead and buried, and he is gone. They were going to be a little bit surprised three days later. But you would think somewhere during the course of history, people would have learned the lesson because people have tried to tell us that God is dead all throughout history. 
They have tried to destroy every aspect of Christianity, to burn every Bible, but they have discovered it cannot be done. 140 years ago, the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche declared, God is dead. He's dead now. And shortly after he passed away, the French Bible Society bought his house, his printing press, and the same printing press that printed his philosophy that God is dead was printing Bibles 140 years ago. In the 1960s, there was a group of theologians who said, God is dead. It made the cover of Time Magazine. Is God, where is he at? Can you, can you imagine how ludicrous to be a theologian and say, we're gonna take God out of theology? That is so, that, that is so, it lends itself to ludicrous questions as well. I have to ask, if God is dead, would you please tell me who was the person that put his, their thumb on his wrist to determine there was no pulse anymore? If God is dead, can you tell me who was the one who signed his death certificate? If God is dead, can you tell me in which newspaper did the obituary column have his obituary written there? If God is dead, can you tell me the person who knew him so well that they could go and identify the body? If God is dead, would you tell me why I wasn't notified? I'm one of his sons. I'm the next of kin. I'm a member of the family. Nobody called me to let me know. I'm here to tell you my skeptic friend, God is alive and well. He is exalted because he humbled and served us. And every Friday that you're going through has a Sunday that has your answer to it. Don't get caught up with Friday. Sunday's coming. Hebrews chapter 3 says this. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of heavenly calling, consider Jesus. You skip to chapter 12 of Hebrews. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Consider Jesus, think about him, look at him. He's the author and finisher. When you are going through your Fridays, don't look at the Friday. You look at the Lord of the Sunday who will bring you through and bring you out. Back at Philippians verse 12, therefore, my dear friends, if you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. As you have always obeyed, continue to work. Don't rewrite your theology because of your tragedy. Because you're going through a difficult time and you don't see the way out, you don't see the answer, you don't understand why you're doing this, don't rewrite your theology to accommodate your tragedy. You have a Friday, Sunday is coming. That is the example that Paul tells us to follow. Have the same mind that Christ did. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. How you can advance out of adversity is we have that same mind, that same attitude of Christ. I know that Sunday's coming. I know he's going to deliver me out of this. I know this is going to turn for my deliverance. I know this is going to serve to advance the gospel. And because I know that, I can endure what I'm going through right now because I know this will not last. This has come to pass, and I will be out on the other side. Did you notice the similarities? We talked a little about Romans 8 last week. Did you notice the similarity between Ephesians 2.13 and Romans 8.28? Philippians 2.13. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Romans 8.28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. In your small group this past week, did you have the discussion that went somewhere along the line that Advancing the gospel does not always mean exactly what you believe to be the best for you. There are times there is a kingdom purpose that is greater than your comfort. Last week I told you the greatest desire, the greatest goal for a Christian is not health, wealth, or prosperity. 
It is being Christ-like. Therefore, the greatest blessing is the thing that gets you on the path to becoming more Christ-like. And the vast majority of the time, the thing that puts us on the path to Christ-likeness is an adversity, a trial, or a problem. It is your Friday that brings you to your Sunday. You advance out of adversity because sometimes you have to embrace your Friday. Sometimes you have to embrace that situation you're going through. Everything that Christ learned, everything that the disciples learned, put us on a path for the church to be born and birthed in Acts chapter 2 that for 2,000 years now has turned the world around. Despite what you hear about the church in America, because I think we have gotten to the point that we don't preach a gospel kingdom anymore, we come in here trying to make everybody in the room happy. And we have forgot what the Word says. But you go to China where they can't even meet on Sunday morning, and our missionaries tell us 30,000 people every day are coming to a salvation knowledge of Jesus Christ in China. They will tell us Africa will be a Christian continent inside the next two decades. There is revival in Latin America. If you pray for a revival in America, understand you may be praying for adversity so that we learn how to humble ourselves before God, seek his face, call on his name, and then he heals our land. All right, that brings us to verse 14. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Would, would, you, would you like for me to say, oh, look at the time. We got to go. <laughs> I'm getting this one in. Do nothing out of selfish ambition and vain conceit. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Never, dis uh, there's two words here. Problem and complaint, they're not always the same. I understand that before I say this. Never discuss your problem or your complaint with someone who is incapable of solving it. Okay? Whatever the problem is, sometimes I get it. You need to vent. Sometimes you've got one of the five people that you selected over the past week to be that, that five people in your prayer team that you've got on your phone now. You just click that one time, send them a text, all five of them get it, those five. Sometimes you just got to vent. Sometimes you got to have somebody to talk to. But when it comes to solving a problem, complaint, you only share that with somebody who has the ability to solve it. You will be remembered for two things. The problems you create and the problems you solve. When it comes down to it, that's how you are going to be remembered. And when you are down, what we see all the way through Philippians chapter 2, help somebody else. When you need uplifting, you humble yourself and you serve others. Last week's assignment was find five people for your prayer circle. Here is this week's assignment. Find one person you can help. Intentionally think about it. We're going we're gonna to take some time to pray about it in just a minute. But find one person that you can give a phone call, you can send a card, you can send a bunt cake to them, you can give a gift card to them. Just find one person this week that you can help and see what it does to you when you help somebody else. Forget about your problem. Forget about your, your trial. Why can I say that? Because it's Friday and Sunday's coming. So find one person you can help this week. I don't have time to deal with Timothy and Epaphroditus. You're going to have to do that on your own. I want to close with one component here. Look at Philippians 2, verse 14. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. There's a reason why we don't complain and gripe. Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. Blameless and pure holiness. Remember the word for selfless ambition? That the element was harlot? Paul now gives us the absolute opposite when he says pure. Unity is easy if you don't care about holiness. He has just told us, conduct yourselves worthy Depraved generations shine like the stars. Unity is easy if you don't care about holiness. Holiness is easy if you don't care about unity. If you don't care about holiness, then everybody can live however they want to live. Do whatever you want to do. Whatever you want to do on Saturday night, Friday night, that's okay. Do whatever you want to do because we just want unity. We just all want to get along. 
If you don't care about holiness, then you lose unity. Because if you don't think the way I do and do it the way I do, and if you do it because I'm going to protect God and I'm going to protect holiness, therefore you kick everybody out of the room. So you can be this real holy group, but you ain't got nobody in your group. You have to have unity and you have to have holiness and you can't have either one without humility. Because if you are going to address holiness, you have to do it with your face down. I don't come to you as somebody who's better than you. I come to you as a child of God. Let me share this word with you because there's something in your life that needs to change and can change. You approach unity that same way. I care about you. And, I, and you've got to have so you can't live in isolation. You can't do this by yourself. You're going to start grinding. You're going to start busting your teeth. You're going to get into all this loneliness thing. You need the unity. You need the body of Christ. And you do that in a humble fashion. Everything that's happening from chapter one to chapter two that fills out through the rest of this book is based on the foundation of I will humble myself before the Lord. And out of that humility, I will follow the example of Christ and I'll find somebody to serve. I know we are, you're, you're accommodating. We don't, we're not able to do the social distancing, uh, but we have, we have yet to bring prayer partners back because we're still hesitant with some of that. But I want us to spend a few moments in prayer congregation-wide before we go this morning. And what I want each and every one of us to do is fulfill that, that admonition from Hebrews, humble yourself before the Lord this morning. And as you pray, Lord, now, now if you've been around church long enough to know, you've heard the phrase, Humble yourself. Don't pray, Lord, humble me, because he just might do that. And you don't want the Lord to do that. You humble yourself before the Lord. And after you have humbled yourself before the Lord, you thank him that you are his child. And because I know who I am in Christ, Lord, direct me to one person this week. You may not show me who it is today during this prayer time. I may be putting gas in my car on Thursday and your spirit's gonna speak to me and say, that's the person over there on the next pump. Go pay for their gas. Just go over there and tell them how you doing. I just wanted to come by and let you know Jesus loves you. I just wanna come by and let you know. I don't know how you, how you are about spiritual things, but I just wanna come by and let you know. I'm gonna be praying for you. Just tell me your first name. Just find somebody and do something kind for one person this week and see what the Holy Spirit does. Let's take a couple of moments in prayer.